move too much. But. Okay, everybody. I am so excited for this topic today. I'm Priscilla Ron, and my special guests are Michael and Catherine Dawson and the esteemed Senator Scott. And before we start, first of all, welcome to our Facebook Live. And Thank you I'm, for having us. <laughs> I'm going to give a little bit of a bio on each of you so that everybody understands who's here in the room. Um, I would like to start with Michael Dawson, who began his career in the oil and gas industry in 1979. And you worked there um, for 18 years. Um, and the majority of the time, you were selling natural gas from a wellhead for oil, pr for oil production company. And your beautiful wife, who you guys are about to celebrate 40 years of marriage, um, yeah. is currently working in the oil and gas industry. So Kathy, Catherine, is an associate landman at Whiting Petroleum Corporation. And you started in the oil and gas industry in 1975 while you were still in high school. Yes, I That's did. amazing. Wow. And in 1980, you earned your... Um, business degree, business administration degree, and you've worked at four different oil and gas companies. And then of course, last but not least, is uh, Senator Scott, who is the Senate Minority Whip. Everybody must respect you, Senator. <laughs> and you are a small business owner, a legit oil and gas expert. You serve on the um, Transportation and Energy Committee. You're a dad you're a husband, and you are also running for county commissioner in Grand Junction. So if anybody's watching this in the Grand Junction area, uh, please support Senator Scott. He is a great um, humanitarian and serving our community for many, many years. All right, let's talk oil and gas. Okay, so I realized that I did not understand oil and gas very well, and so, I'm really interested in this topic because CU offers a master's degree um, in the oil and gas industry in their, in their business department. And so there's a lot of controversy, there's a lot of conversation talking uh, concerning oil and gas and, and transportation and all that. So first I wanna ask, um, what role does oil and gas play in our everyday lives? And why should people care about oil and gas? Who wants to take that? Senator should probably take that one. <laughs> They're saying Senator. Oh, <laughs> Senator, you're on uh, mute. So we're gonna, there you go. Okay. I just unmuted myself. Sorry about that. <clears throat> well, you know, as, as you said, <clears throat> uh, for whatever reasons, I mean, there's a there's a whole list of reasons why there's been this uh, um, controversy, if you will, on the Eastern Slope. I think it, it was just fine until some of the oil and gas industry kind of started getting closer to subdivisions and things of that nature. And, uh, you know, I always look at it like a golf course. They build a golf course and people build their homes around the golf course. And then they complain that golf balls are bouncing off the roofs. You know, it's kind of like, well, you moved there, didn't you? You, you know, you knew it was there, but I think that's what kind of started some of the uproar, uh, on, on the East slope. We don't have that over here on the East, on the Western slope. Uh, as far as what oil and gas does for us, I mean, number one, going way, way back, it's what we built our entire country on was low cost energy. That's, that's how we all, we went through the industrial age. Uh, many, many things happened in those days uh, that brought our, our society to where it is today. And <clears throat> all fossil fuels were part of that, that mix. Uh, today, I believe it's something like 6,800 different products that we're wearing and we use and medications are that come from uh, petroleum based products. Uh, somebody the other day asked me about the, you know, the hand sanitizer. Well, that's, that's a petroleum based product. That's, I think I can't remember if it's Exxon or one of the companies actually has the patent on that, that recipe, if you will, uh, for the hand sanitizer. So there's so many, many different things, not to mention just the normal transportation things that we're used to where we jump in our car and we go someplace. Uh, you know, we're, we're so used to fossil fuel generation that it's, it's just a part of our everyday lives, right? And uh, it's something that's obviously very important. <clears throat> and we're finding out as a state in our state budget, as we speak, just how important oil and gas really is to the state. 
uh, for revenues. I, I have information on severance taxes that come off of the oil and gas production. And it touches basically everything you can imagine from water treatment plants to firehouses, to schools, to roads and bridges. Uh, there's not a place that it really doesn't touch. Uh, and so for it to be controversial is kind of interesting because it's something that drives our lives. Uh, but, you know, we live in, in different times, right? People have, have got different ideas about on uh, what we should do. And, and uh, we can talk about that a little bit as, you, as we move along. Sure. You know, uh, Catherine, you and I were talking about this the other day. You're like, <clears throat> see this pen? You see this like hair clip? You see this coffee mug? It's like all made. Oh, and right. when you said that, it was like a light bulb went off because you know, it's not my world. And I'm like, wow, like really it does impact everything that we, yes, we right. do. Now, I had a question about fracking because I kept hearing all these ads, like fracking is good, fracking is bad. And I didn't know. And so, um, Mr. and Mrs. Dawson, would you like to explain to us what fracking is? I think it's one of the most, may I? Go ahead. But this is one of my this is one of my favorite things. This is say. how you guys have stayed married for forty years, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but Mr. Dawson, I need you to use your outside voice because you're a little far away from the speaker. Okay. All right. <laughs> hey, I was a speech major in high school. I should do that. I should I should be able to do that. So this is one of the most annoying conversations. It's one of the things that comes up with your friends. You know, everybody you know, everybody wants to talk about fracking as though fracking is some um, sinister new thing that the oil industry is doing that threatens our lives. And in fact, most of the oil and gas production um, that, that's flowing actually has come from wells that have been fracked. It's just the technical term for fracturing the horizon, the producing horizon from which the oil and gas uh, comes and so that it will flow out come to the surface. And there's a lot of different ways of doing it, a lot of different technologies. I've been out of the industry for 20 years now, and fracking technology has advanced quite a bit since, since I was in the industry, but the principle is still the same. And people don't realize that all you're saying, if you're saying to the oil industry that we think that fracking is like a bad thing, they're saying don't produce oil and gas so that we could drive our cars and heat our houses and, and that kind of thing. They really don't even know what they're asking for. So yeah. Kathy, you were explaining like what what is used to frack. Can you break that down for us like real simply? Real simply, it's just a solution that causes the rock to, when it's put down into the hole, when it's pressurized and put down into the hole, it causes the fragments where the oil is kept in the rock to break open to allow the oil to come back up so yeah. that we can have it. Yeah. I mean, the, people always look at fracking as the other F word is what I call it. <laughs> and I keep thinking, okay, you came here to rally against fracking. Did you come here on foot? Because if you didn't, you're using the oil that's coming out of the ground through fracking. You've benefited from it. You're using it in your cars. You're using it to cook your food. Give me a break. So you know, and one thing I might throw in there too is it's 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 pretty well known, but it doesn't get talked about a lot uh, because really what we're talking about with these fracking fluids is a very inert material. Uh, there's been tests that show what you wash in your dishwasher or if you wash your clothes in a in a, in a uh, washing machine you're putting more chemicals into the sewer system than what they put down the hole when they do fracking. Right. A lot of folks right. just don't realize that. Interesting. Right. So um, how does one get into the oil and gas business? So um, Michael, you were in marketing and Catherine, you're in land. Um, Senator, you've worked for different, you, Conoco and some other companies. So. Mm -hmm. Can you guys share how do people get in? I mean, there's like, I've seen off the coast of Texas, like there's offshore. So mm -hmm. the people who work there, I mean, how does one get into all of these different areas of the oil and gas industry? A lot of times it's just like getting any other job, you know, some young person's in college and they're, they're looking for what kind of work they're gonna do when they get out and they 
They look around, around look what, in, what interests them. They'll find a company. They may go to work for a company, not really knowing a whole lot about the specifics of the company. And your business acumen gets you in because, I mean, it's a business. And so they, a lot of different business skills are required to run these companies and a lot of different technical skills. There's some unique applications of all those business and technical skills because the oil and gas industry is so unique in that sense. But it's just like anybody else going out and applying for a job. You see a job, uh, you uh, add to someplace and you go in and apply and, and you go to work. And for like for me, I didn't know hardly anything about the oil and gas industry. Even growing up in Oklahoma, I didn't. And when I met, and when I met this woman, she was working in the oil business. I was like, it was just like going over. <laughs> I had no idea what it meant. I mean, I was, you know, it was around me, but I didn't know anything about it. And um, I got a, a job um, working in an area where um, my, I had some legal background and had knowledge of contracts. And so for me, the connection was going in, administering these contracts, writing contracts, negotiating contracts and things like that. And of course, learning to do the contracts, you learn about what those contracts are about. And they actually put me in places where I would have to administer contact contracts that taught me the industry. And so I, I learned how the industry functions in a practical sense in that way, because I don't, I don't have a business class in my history, let alone a business degree. I think I took typing two in high school. That's my highest business class. <laughs> but, I, I, but I went into... I, I learned business in the in the oil and gas industry. That's where I really got uh, introduced in, to to business. And I started out as a secretary, you know, being in high school. It was a work program, and I knew how to type really well. I knew how to take shorthand, and that's how I got started. And they taught me to plot wells on a map. I didn't know anything about a map other than looking at it to see to get from one point to the other. She doesn't do that well. And I don't do that well now. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I learned uh, township ranges and sections, you know, where uh, they were going to look for oil and gas. And we put a, uh, put a little dot. Okay. This is where we're going to look this time over in this area. And I just kept moving up through the ranks. I even did accounting. I did division order work where you learn how to put people in the system to pay them to go on their property to use it for our benefit, for their benefit, for everybody's benefit. And now I'm a landman. Don't ask me why. I just <laughs> <laughs> real quick, uh, real quick, explain what a landman does. We negotiate to go on people's property to just drill on their land. We actually pay them. Uh, probably a yearly amount. Sometimes it's a monthly amount, but usually it's, we draw up a contract, it's called a lease, and we ask them, can we put this surface hole on your property to drill for oil and gas? And they say yes, and we pay them. And then they so I can have you come to my property and s test and see if there's any oil, oil on my property, and then I can retire? Is that <laughs> if it were that easy, all of us would be fit. But no, not it's not exact. that easy. <laughs> so, Senator Scott, how did you get into this industry? Well, you know, when I was in high school, I actually worked for what they call a, uh, a petroleum jobber. What that is is the guy that drives a little truck and you go out to farms and ranches and deliver fuel right. for the farm and ranch industry. Right. <clears throat> and uh, I kind of had this fascination with the bigger trucks, right? The great big trucks. And then I came to, to Grand Junction from a small town east of here called Rifle and uh, kind of got my start working in what they called a, a products terminal. Uh, and that's where they had the big trucks. So I was all excited about these great big semis. Uh, and I, so I was ended up in the transportation division. <clears throat> so that had everything to do with, you know, learning how the distribution of the, the refined products went uh, to gas stations and to farm use and to airports and all kinds of different applications. And that also included our pipeline systems. So I kind of got into the pipeline side and they just called it the transportation division. All right. And uh, that's kind of where I got my start was, was learning from there. And, it, and then when you're around the industry uh, and the, the, the other employees, you meet all kinds of people because they have everything, you know, from geologists, to lots of scientists. Uh, it was a fascinating uh, career 
because you just met so many very, very smart people. Yeah. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. So now that I understand that oil and gas impacts everything in our lives every single day, with the impact of COVID-19, um, how has that impacted the oil and gas industry? Who wants to take that? Yeah, yeah. it's taking it on. It's a the tough channel. one um, because I'm working from home. We've had to shut in, which means stop production on the wells that we've drilled because there's no place to take that production. We just have to hold on to it. And with everything going into the tank, excuse my pun, um, the, the cost that it takes for us to get our, our product from one place to another has gone down so much that it's not feasible. We can't make any money off of it. And it's caused us to have to rethink how we're going to produce it, how we're going to get it to where it needs to go, and how to make enough money to pay the employees to get it done. I was talking about this to a friend this week um, that didn't understand what would go on in the industry at times like this. And I was just kind of talking about the part of like, you just can't, you can't just shut off the spigot, you know, when, when production um, can't, doesn't have a place to go into the marketplace, you have to systematically shut these wells in. Mm -hmm. And it takes, because I was really impacted by this as a marketer, because I was really important, it was really essential for me to kind of know when and how much gas was going to get to my customers, you know. And sometimes it meant whether or not you could burn your furnace in your city, you know, when I, what I was doing. And it just, it, you, you have to strategically shut them in. And then some that, you know, there's a technical risk with that because it depends on the wells, some of them you lose, some of them you never get back. And uh, they'll never come back on is what that means. And, and then when you bring them back up, it takes some time. So you can't just flip a switch like your lights. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a big deal. It is a huge logistical thing and it's and technological challenge too. Sure. Well, you know, part of the problem too is obviously what's what's taking place is with the COVID nineteen crisis, which it's it's just fascinating to me how much damage has been done to our economy with, with, within the last two months. It's just unbelievable. But you know, the, the use of jet fuel has dropped dramatically. Yeah. Tra any transportation fuel. I mean, the roads, at least on my side of the mountain, are, are we're still pretty busy. But I've noticed when I come to Denver, it's just there's just no traffic. I mean, there's a lot of less use of fossil fuels or gasoline in this case absolutely uh so that's that's created the problem that we're talking about is that you have to if there's no place if they don't need to refine it then it doesn't need to be produced so right. it's 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 a fascinating journey a lot of people don't realize this and maybe this is important uh if you go east of the continental divide which is the front range area there's that's oil production that's predominantly oil production when you come west of the continental divide towards grand junction where i live we are natural gas production. So it's right. kind of, we have kind of two different worlds mixed into one state, which is pretty right. fascinating. Right. Now, something that's odd that's happening because we've all heard the, the price of oil has dropped dramatically. And that's because of exactly what we're talking about is they, they've been capping these wells, but also on those wells is something called associated gas. Yeah. So there is natural gas that comes off of an oil well. Right. It's a little different. We have a dry gas here, that's a wet gas, but. Right. With that gas coming off the market, the dry gas or the, where I live, uh, there's the futures market looks like we're going to go vertical on uh, to something about, which this is a good number for us, about five bucks per thousand cubic feet of natural gas. Oh, sweet. Yeah, right now it's about a buck, well, it was about a buck right. and a quarter. I, I think it's moved up to about 230 already. So in a weird, strange way, we may see increased activity west of the continental divide and less activity in what's called the dj basin which is north of, of denver now another interesting dynamic to that is we are like 77 percent uh federal lands where i live mm -hmm. so where the most of the operations have been has been on private land in the eastern plains so when you talk about working on federal lands versus private lands that's another whole dynamic that's that's been changing uh, but all in all, we'll have to see how these markets shake out. I mean, I could kind of go on and on about this stuff, but there's, 
there's potentials for export markets that are just fascinating to me. Uh, there's a project called Jordan Cove, which is up in Coos Bay, Oregon. And again, going back to pipelines, we have a pipeline network that runs up north of Grand Junction to the Wyoming border. It splits there and then goes, one goes towards Chicago and the other side goes towards Oregon. The idea is that they're going to build an export terminal in Coos Bay, Oregon, so we can export natural gas. There's already contracts in place uh, with the Japanese governor, government uh, to buy billions of cubic feet of natural gas from our supply. Uh, that makes us part of a solution, not part of a problem. Nice. Because as many people don't realize, there's, there's at least a billion people around the world that have no ability to have natural gas or any oil. They're still burning wood to cook dinner. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable to even think about, but uh, they need our help desperately. It's a world market. It's not just a Colorado market. Uh, we have the ability to really go out and do great things for humanity with the resources we have. If we could just, you know, I always say that the resource isn't a problem. It's fine. The technology is not a problem. It's fine. It's politics. <laughs> Politics, <laughs> politics screws up everything. So that's really kind of where we're at. We're having weird politics in Colorado on, on energy and other states. But then you go to someplace like North Dakota, they embrace the energy and they embrace the technology. And, you know, they end up with a couple of billion dollars in reserves in their banks to do all kinds of things. And of course, now we're looking at a $3 billion deficit. So uh, the speed, the, you know, the, the numbers speak very loudly. Yeah, this was a very different conversation in Texas and Oklahoma. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we were talking again last week about you talk about oil and then gas. Is this what you're uh, referring to, Senator, when you say wet gas? Because you're okay. Sure. All yeah. right, you used a new term I didn't know, and I'm like, is he uh, talking about oil? And so, from the wet gas, you get your gasoline, and you also get your petroleum. Is this right? And then your, yeah, you're looking at me like I don't know what you're talking about. This is why you're on the show, and I'm not explaining. But help me understand, like how they're the two are used differently in everyday life, because I know like my gas stove uses gas right but there's also for my grill outside is a different kind yeah. of gas go so ahead you take it wet, wet really it refers to the btu content mm -hmm. of the gas Jeez. right and that's a so that's like uh, gosh i'm not a te technical <laughs> guy and i have to explain btu to somebody um i can't i can't I remember how to explain remember. that but btu content is like how it will determine how it burns, you know, um, Senator jump in. Okay, I, well, I'm, I'm glad to, I mean, <laughs> when you talk, when you talk about a stream of natural gas or oil or wet gas, you can kind of combine all those together because all these different, there's a lot of different hydrocarbons that come off of that. So you get right. a, a product called pentane, you get butane, butane is something you see in those little lighters that you have to light your, your birthday cake candles. That's butane. You have propane, which goes to your, your barbecue in a little white tank. Uh, there's all kinds of these, these spinoff hydrocarbons that get used for uh, even your, the, something called isobutane, which is what's in your can of spray deodorants. If you look at the ingredients on the back, you're gonna, that's what causes it to propel uh, out of the can. So th there's multiple levels of hydrocarbons that are, are split and separated from a stream of gas and there's even something called natural gasoline, which then goes to the refineries and gets additives put to it. And then, of course, you put it in your car and drive down the street. Uh, it's a very that's vast from, product. That's from a gas processing process that I was trying to right. facility the other go. day. That's what he's, that's um, yep. higher the BTU content. And that means there's more of that stuff that you can extract from the gas. And it goes through a processing system that all those things fall out of it, essentially. And, and leave the dry base. Yeah. So, um, Senator, what percentage of the state is reliant on oil and gas? I mean, because we know that this is impacting mm -hmm. bringing in revenue into our state, but I just, I didn't know how much, how, how much of an impact oil and gas has in our state. I would argue that it touches every single person on every square inch of Colorado. No. And what I mean by that is that 
Uh, the reports are very clear that we have $31 billion per year in economic activity that comes off of energy, whatever the source might be, whether it's coal production, oil, natural gas, any kind of a fossil fuel, we're sitting at 31 billion. Uh, our state budget's 32 billion, to put it, that into perspective. Uh, about 225,000 people in Colorado work for part of an energy sector of some type. Uh, it's a massive, massive impact. And, you know, to, and then you start to break down where does the, the, the money flow, correct, right? So you've got severance tax dollars, which if anybody out there doesn't know what that means, severance tax means when you're severing something from the earth. So we get a tax for, for severing the oil from the dirt, if you will. That's a severance tax. Then that money flows into a very large pot uh, that also includes water projects around the state. So the, the nice little lake you see behind me, uh, dam projects, irrigation projects, agricultural projects. There, it, it just touches so many different things. Uh, the schools depend in, immensely on revenue that's generated by oil and gas and severance taxes and property taxes. With, if, if this industry were, and I don't think it will completely stop, but if it were, uh, take 31 billion off the table and 225,000 people out of the state, that's how drastic it is. And, and, and of course, there's probably somebody watching out there that's gonna say, oh my God, well, we can just convert to solar and wind. Well, I call that unreliable energy. Uh, solar has a big problem. It's called nighttime. The wind doesn't always blow, right? The battery technology is way behind. They're working very hard. I get it. And I, I, don't, I think there's a place for all of these products on the market. I don't, I'm an all of the above kind of guy. But you can't destroy one industry to try to promote another. We will fall flat on our face. We, we cannot do it. And there are people in this state that actually believe we could literally just shut down oil and gas tomorrow and not even worry about any of it and just use wind and solar. I would argue, get yourself really sick, go to the hospital and depend on just solar for your heart monitor to make sure it's gonna be correct. Uh, that's a scary proposition. We have a very even, nice energy sector that's moving very well. And if we disrupt that, I think we're gonna, we're gonna pay a dear price. You know, that kind of segues perfectly into my next question about, you know, this current generation really cares about clean air, where that's a oh, topic absolutely. of conversation. So how does the oil and gas industry respond to this topic when you hear young people say that they want more clean air? I had, I've been, I was in the industry in 1979 when I entered in, in the industry this was a topic that was just just emerging, you know. And during my time in the industry, I found my experience with the oil and gas industry was they were all always at the forefront of trying to solve the problem. I mean, to some to some extent, there was some of it was government mandated, but some of it was just you know companies just wanted to be responsible humanitarians and human you know uh, in their service to humanity, they wanted to do things the right way. There were, there were hiccups and there were things that happened that people did wrong, but by and large, the industry has always wanted to do the right thing for uh, the people that it serves for communities that they're in, because people that, are, that run these industry, this industry are just like us. They're just people. They're just normal people. Oh, but you know, you're bad people. <laughs> I've, been, I've actually been told that. <laughs> I'm, told I'm that. joking. I'm totally joking. But that's so clear well, that, that, that the oil and gas people are like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's the way they act. They act like we're up here in a tower somewhere, not caring about how everything impacts our environment. Sure. We live here too. We live in the same environment. We live in the same environment. Sure. We care about the same things that everybody else cares about. And I don't think I could promote something that's going to destroy us. I don't. No. I, I don't. I don't see that happening. Sure. Called having a moral yeah. obligation to do what's right. You know, it, it is fascinating. If you do, the, if you do the research, you'll you actually find that things like the death rate or the morbidity rate uh, has has changed by eighty percent since uh, the modern days of oil and gas technology mm -hmm. to today. Right. Uh, there were. 
the thousands and millions literally of lives that have been saved by technology and things that were developed, medications and all the different things that have happened uh, over the years, have, you, you have to look at fossil fuels as the place where that came from. Uh, some people don't want to talk about that. They, don't, they just want to deny that. Uh, but I would argue, also argue that a lot of young people are being indoctrinated within the school systems. Uh, they're not allowed to have these conversations. It's, it's kind of a green new deal or nothing discussion. Uh, and I find that a very, very unfortunate, but uh, I've had, I have had the opportunity to talk to students and they're fascinated when you start to talk to them because what they're kind of taught is that uh, a power plant or an oil and gas industry type operation is the old picture you used to see on TV with the black smoke pouring out of the smokestacks when it really is more almost like NASA and the space shuttle. Uh, if you were, have the ability to get out and see one of these operations and they allow you to take a look at it, it is absolutely fascinating to watch. It's almost like a, 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 a video game that kids play today. As some, one man sits in a cabin and he actually runs everything with a joystick. It's, it's a fascinating technology that they've come so far. When you can drill you know, 10,000 feet down and 10,000 feet or two miles horizontal and hit a two foot circle, uh, that's technology. That's not somebody just out there willy nilly drilling all over the place. Uh, the industry's done so much in the last few years. Uh, even I've noticed it even on the Eastern Plains that they figured out better technology so that they don't have to take up a, a bigger footprint. So you might see one well pad, but they've drilled 30 different wells off that one well pad. Where it used to be, they'd go down and drill 30 well pads. Well, right. all that all that has changed. So the environmental impact and the footprint has changed so much. Uh, and, it's fascinating to see. And a lot of it is just adding new technology to things that they've learned that they had to do oh, yeah. in the past. Like I used to sell natural gas from some wells in, in, in the city of Beverly Hills, California. Gas wells in the city of Beverly Hills, California. Yeah. I guarantee yeah. you there are people that don't even know that they're there <laughs> sure, because, sure. because of what they had to do to... Um, not have not allow it to impact the community that it was in and it was that's one of that's a very high profile community and very you know a sure. lot of money and very vocal and uh, it was it was fascinating to me to kind of see how the technology kept sort of evolving you know because every every few years there would be some new um i don't know some new thing that crisis that we're trying to head off at the past so it wouldn't be a, a day five years from now that something happened that the city of Beverly Hills was on the news because of some oil wells in that in that city. But it was, you know, it's it, there are things going on that, like that they don't people have no idea just how much thought is put into it, how much forethought, and sure. how vigorously people have been working on these on these uh, problems for years. I'd love to have the folks in Bloomfield talk to the folks in Beverly Hills. And <laughs> learn you know, it's, it, you, you know, know speaking of that, it's, it's kind of funny too because. Uh, <laughs> I know there, there's a certain group in every county or every city that has a problem with something. It doesn't matter what mm -hmm. it is. It's just got to be something you have to have a problem. And I was talking to a gentleman in the city of Denver. He, he said, you know, thank God we don't have any oil and gas production anywhere close to the city of Denver. And he was kind of going, out to <laughs> and I said, well, I said, have you ever been to the, to the airport? And he goes, well, of course I have. And I said, well, that's one of the largest plays of oil there is. And, and that's the city of Denver. Because they actually produce their own oil and they have a deal with Suncor to produce their own jet fuel. Right. But they, they won't talk about it. They're not going to talk about it because it's in the city of Denver. Right. And they've got, they've got to have that for an economic driver for DIA. And right. Yeah, bring that up to people that, that oppose oil and gas. And it just it drives them crazy because you're like, you've got to be kidding me. Uh, the old wow. Lowry. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. But if that's crazy. Next, time you, next time you fly out of DIA, look out the windows. Because you know it has a massive footprint, as the, the airport property, and you'll see oil wells operating as you're flying out of, yeah. of the IO. Well, I'm gonna have to look for that now. I got yep. some <laughs> instead yep. of looking at the horse with his. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah I, don't, <laughs> you know? I don't like. I don't like that part. <laughs> um, I don't so, you know, so Catherine had alluded to this senator about, and so did Michael about how the oil and gas industry really does care about. Um, making sure that they're being responsible. I would imagine as a legislator that you pass legislation to make sure that there are certain things done to keep people safe. 
um, talking about that or any other legislation right now, what is the hot topic in legislation with oil and gas right now? Well, you know, uh, obviously last year there was a bill that was passed and it was called Senate Bill 181, uh, which is a bill that really, uh, to a certain degree, was kind of the last stake in the heart of a lot of operators in Colorado. It was done in the name of safety in the environment. Uh, but it, it goes way too far. It's pushing, and the, the whole idea is to move away from fossil fuel production, that's the bottom line, to transition to something else. Uh, what's, what they're learning right now is because of something none of us could expect called COVID-19, uh, this is what it looks like if you transition, right? Right now this is what it looks like. You know, 40 or 50% of the office space in downtown Denver are energy companies the 200,000 workers I talked about, uh, the, the revenue that is lost. This is what it looks like if you immediately pull yourself or try to pull yourself away from a very stable and clean energy source and try to move to something else. There is no way on, on this earth that the wind and the solar that's available in Eastern Colorado can, can power what we need both personally and business-wise in Colorado. Uh, there, I, I hate to say it this way, but I think some of those folks are getting a dose of what reality really looks like. And as this economic crisis sets in deeper, they're gonna get a bigger dose. Uh, we start back the 26th, we have to cut $3.5 billion from our state budget and about $7 billion over the next two years. That, those are massive cuts. That, that, is, that are numbers that I, I never would have dreamed of. Uh, that means every person again in the city of Colorado is gonna feel this they're gonna feel it very hard. It's gonna hit schools. Uh, it'll hit higher education. It's gonna hit places that people do not wanna ever discuss about cutting funding for, uh, but we have no choice and we don't have anything to back them. So this is what the future looks like. Should you say, we don't want oil and gas, we don't want any fossil fuel production in Colorado. This is your new future because there is no way to backfill that. I remember asking one of our senators at the time who was running a piece of legislation to literally just basically say all oil and gas production must stop. And I asked him the question, how do we backfill the 31 billion? And his answer was, I will tax the hell out of you. Well, there it is. I mean, that's exactly the answer. That's the only thing you could do. Now we do have something in Colorado called Tabor, love it or hate it, it's kept us from being bankrupt. If we wanna raise a tax, we have to ask you the voters for permission to do so. And so we are in a very interesting dynamic here. And the next few weeks is gonna be fascinating. And it's gonna be very painful, quite frankly, to go through the budget process because we have massive amounts of money and we have to cut from the budget. And as you all know, counties and cities are a quasi arm of state government. So if a program gets shut down at the state level, it's a domino effect all the way down the, the line. So it, this is not gonna be a pleasant time and, and this could go on for several years unless Quite frankly, if we could get the energy industry to help come back, they can boost us up out of this. $31 billion is not a joke. That, that's a tremendous amount of force in an economy. And they are part of the solution to come out of the COVID crisis. We just have to have more people to recognize that. Wow, that, that is a big dose of reality there. And you mentioned education because as an educator, yep who's teaching full time in Denver and running for a CU, these conversations are painful because they impact our young people who then impact sure. our future workforce. It's an economic sure. circle here. And I hope people who are watching are paying attention and educating themselves because I'm not about telling people what to think. I think I, I give you the tools to figure out how to think for yourself. And I want people to become educated on this topic because the more people who understand how our government system works, how here in the state of Colorado we uh, receive revenue, the better they'll be able to problem solve around this. I can't imagine being a legislator and looking at a budget and seeing all of the important things that matter to so many people and touch so many people and make cuts, but we have to brace ourselves. I think that's the big message that we are all gonna feel the burn here. We're gonna feel it, you know? So be thoughtful in how much we protest against our legislators because it, it, it's not gonna do us any good to get angry. We just have to figure out a way 
to open our economy back. I think that's the big message, open our economy back. Let's, let's get people working again so that we can um, bring in revenue because nobody wants to pay more taxes. I mean, I don't want to pay more taxes. You? Well, you know, and, and I actually do have to jump off here in just a second, but I would say this is, uh, it will be fascinating to watch this process as we go forward. We might actually be having to actually rethink what is the purpose of government? We may be stepping into an arena now because of the, the crisis where we have to say, okay, do we need to reduce the size and scope of government to what maybe what we believe it should be? You know, worrying about infrastructure spending, worrying about the weakest among us, which we always do that, and that's important work. Uh, worrying about K-12 education, for example. Those are fundamental functions of government, and we may have to kind of look at the list of things that get cut and say, okay, is that better done by the private sector in the future than government trying to step in and do everything? This may be an opportunity for us to kind of redesign not only state government, but local government as well. So Mike and Catherine, we're gonna, we're gonna close this out. Do you have any final thoughts and words? So on this topic or? No. I would say, me personally, I would say do your homework. If you want to be informed to make the right decisions, do your homework and take all of your biases, push them aside and look at the facts. Stop looking at the myths, stop listening to the myths, look at the facts, then make the correct decision. And I'd say, if you don't want fossil fuels, you better get a horse. Oh, you better get a bunch of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, Michael, Catherine, Senator Scott, thank you so much for educating me on this topic. I feel more informed and um, just appreciate all that you do in your service to making sure we have money coming into our state and for our, our kids for sure. So. Well, thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you guys you. be well. All right. Take care. Bye.